So welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. Uh, for the next three weeks, we have some interesting talks coming up. Robert Rausendorf ne next week, Marius Junga, and Paul Fenley. And today we're really happy to have Chengwei Lu from Tsinghua University, who's now in Cambridge, Mass. And he'll tell us about this new subject, quantum Fourier analysis, that he started about four years ago with Chen uh, Jiang and Jin Sun Wu, and which is a very interesting thing. So Cheng Wei, the floor is for you. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, first, I, I would like to thank the organizers for asking me to give a talk at the Mathematical Picture Language Seminar. Um, uh, this is a work uh, that uh, we recently published a paper about this title at PNAS and joined with Chunlan Jiang and the author. Jeffy, uh, myself, and Yun Xiang, Lin, Jin Song, Wu. It's 2020. Uh, well, I will mainly talk about the idea in that paper, and you can find further references in that paper. So first, I, I would like to um, explain what we mean by quantum Fourier analysis. So I think here people are familiar with each single word. Like we are familiar with quantum, and we know the mathematician Fourier, and we know it's analysis, Fourier analysis. And the idea of Fourier analysis or Fourier transform go back 20, uh, sorry, 200 years ago. So for the Fourier transform, it's first given by integration for function over the reals. Well, let's see, see infinity. And it has been used to solve very interesting problems like the heat equation or in general some different equation. And a very important point is uh, the different operator may look difficult at the beginning, but if you look at the Fourier deal, the operator is diagonalized. And then the problem of solving differential equation becomes much simpler. So some problem, problem becomes easier on the Fourier deal. And uh, algebraically, the Fourier transform has a very interesting property that we can consider two kind of algebraic properties. One is given by the multiplication of functions, and the other is given by the convolution of the group structure. And then the Fourier transform intertwines the two algebraic structure. So this is a very important algebraic property of the Fourier transform. And another important analytic property is that the Fourier transform preserves the two norm This definition of two norm and the Fourier transform preserves the two norm. And there are various inequality related to, related to the Fourier transform. Uh, in particular, like in quantum mechanics, there is the important Fourier duality given by the position operator and the momentum operator. And they are also Fourier dual to each other. This is position. Momentum. 
uh, there is a famous uncertainty principle called Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So it tells we cannot measure both precisely at the same time. And there are various mathematical formulation for that. You can compute, for example, the deviation of both operators and you show they have a lower bound. Or you can compute the entropy of both and you can also show they have a lower bound. And there are different kinds of formulation. But the general conceptual idea is that in the quantum world, we cannot measure both precisely at the same time. And uh, there are many, also many interesting applications of the Fourier analysis in modern mathematics. So first, before going to the general thing, uh, let's start with a very classic example. So we consider the classical symmetry as group symmetry. And there are many other kinds of symmetry go beyond the group symmetry. And many of them come from quantum field theory. So we consider that as quantum symmetry. And nowadays there are a lot of interesting studies about quantum symmetry, like quantum algebra, quantum topology, quantum geometry. And here we really want to emphasize the analysis on quantum symmetries, and in particular on the Fourier duality. That's what we consider as quantum Fourier transform. So here we first consider a classical symmetry that's group, and we consider the Fourier transform as classical Fourier analysis. The CFA. Now, for simplicity, I will take a finite group G. And then there are two different ways to impose the algebraic structure or multiplications for G. I will take the word A model and B model from string theory or mirror symmetry, but this is not the same thing. I just take the same word to distinguish the two sides. So A on the A side, we can take the functions on the group, and then it has the usual multiplication as multiplication of functions. And also it has a second multiplication, that's the convolution. And this space has a measure. It's a big measure. And if we consider this as a special measure, it's actually the higher measure. It's invariant under the action of the convolution. And in that sense, the measure is, becomes unique. So now we have multiplication, convolution, and measure. Unless we have measure, we can ask for analysis. And there are interesting inequalities related to the two multiplication and the measure. And one example is the Young's inequality. So it said if we have two functions, f and g, and then we can take the convolution. Now if we compute its R norm, it's bounded by P norm of F and the Q norm of G. So here P inverse plus Q inverse is R inverse plus one. Well, the P norm is defined by the usual definition. It's absolute value P. piece power and take the integration and then take one of piece power. So this is the uh, uh, classical Young's inequality. You see in this inequality, when we compute the P norm, we take the higher measure and we use the standard multiplication of functions. 
And then we want to compute the norm for the convolution. So it, it relates two different kind of multiplications. Well, this is the usual way to read the Yangtze inequality for a group. Now let me give you a different way to consider a similar phenomenon. We call it the B side. And this is kind of the far dual version. So now we take algebra, which is a group algebra. So here we can have a very concrete realization. We take the group acting on the previous space L2G. So this is also called the left regular representation. Now under this representation, the multiplication of the group becomes the multiplication of the matrix under this representation. So now we can consider the usual multiplication as matrix multiplication. And then we have a second multiplication on the matrix. It's the pointwise multiplication, also called the Hartmann product. Namely, we have two matrix AIJ and BIJ. And here for the second multiplication, I consider that as a convolution. So I use the star symbol. And it's the pointwise multiplication for each entry. And it's known as the Hartmann product. And also here, on matrix, there is a very natural measure, it's a trace. Now, given a group on the other side, somehow we consider that as the Fourier due, all the representations of the group. Then we have multiplication and convolution given by the Hartmann product and measure given by the trace. And then we can write down similar formula for the Yangtze inequality. So now we take two matrix. And then we can take the Hartmann product of the two matrix matrices and compute their P norm and Q norm. Well, here F is a matrix. When we say it's P norm, we are actually computing the absolute value by power decomposition of this matrix, and then compute its P norm. So here F absolute value is F star F to one half. And its P norm is given by a similar formula. We take P power power and that's given by functional calculus. And then we take its trace and then take one over P power. Well, on one side, we are familiar with that. That's the usual setup of the Yangtze inequality. Now on the far due side, this is the unusual setup yeah. and it's still true. So here you see for the classical symmetry, the group case, actually there are two different ways to set up the Yangtze inequality. And now we can see the one is the far due of the other. And both of them can be proved by classical methods in Fourier analysis. But one is the usual one, the other one is unusual. And this is the first example. Here we mentioned for the classical Fourier analysis, it's the Yangtze inequality. Now let me give you a second example that we can look at the two different inequalities on two different sides. No, sorry, the same kind of inequality on two different sides. So, for the second inequality, if we take f and g to be both positive, maybe two positive functions, and then it's easy to show their convolution is still positive. Since the convolution is given by the integration, it preserves positivity. Now let's call this a convolution positivity.
So this is on the A side. Now on the B side, we take two metrics to be positive operators. And then the convolution is the hot mat product. And the hot mat product of two positive operators is still positive. And this result is known as the sure product theory. So once again, on the A side, this is a, a straightforward properties for convolution. On the B side, uh, it's also easy to prove, but it becomes less obvious. And it's also very interesting positivity properties. And um, usually people don't relate to the to two as the same thing. But here, under the Fourier duality, we can see they are actually the same phenomenon. And the third one, it's called the sum site estimate. And this is widely used in additive combinatorics. And here we mentioned the most basic inequality. So if we take two sites, two subsets, of the group G. Let's say uh, S and T. And then the sum set estimate is the estimates of the addition of the two subsets. And then we can count the cardinality. And we will have, we have a first estimate, it's cardinality will be bigger than the cardinality of S and T. But for the group case, this is also straightforward. Since we will take sum, of course, you preserve at least one copy of S and T, I shift that. So they keep the cardinality. And in, uh, the, for the classical one, it's important to know for which subset we have the equality. And that inverse problem will give you a very interesting characterization of the site. And that's kind of key point to use the analytic estimates to understand analytic properties by looking at the extremal condition, and usually called the inverse problem. And here we'll first talk about inequalities and also uh, in the quantum fire analysis, we have similar phenomenon. Namely, we characterize the equality for the inequality and then the extreme measure give very interesting algebraic properties. Now, now let's rewrite the statement in terms of functions on G. You take two projections one is the indicator function on subset S, and the other is the indicator function on subset T. And then the sum of the two subsets can be regarded as the convolution of the two functions. And we know it's still positive by convolution positivity. And then we can take the range of this positive functions. And then we can measure that. And now let's denote this by, we call the support of the two functions, of the convolution of two functions. So then we can rewrite the sum set estimate as the support of the convolution of the two function or two projections that's bigger or equal to the support of any one of them. So this is the 
same thing, the sum set has to make, but now I rewrite this as functions on the group. And then actually you can further generalize this by changing the projection to arbitrary positive function, but they are the uh, equivalent statement. Now, let's do this sum set estimate on the B side. We call it under the Fourier duality. We have two different sides. Let's see what happened on B side. So on the B side, instead of taking two indicator functions, we take two projections, P and Q. Two projections in this group algebra. And then we can take their Hartmut product. And we consider that as a convolution. And again, we can take the support. of the Hadamard product. And here was the meaning of the pot. So we take this Hadamard product and then by the sure product theorem, we know this operator is a positive operator. And then for the positive operator, we can take its range projection and then we take the trace, the similar to the previous statement. And that's the definition of support. Now we say the support of the Hadamard product is still bounded by the part of each single operator. So this is the non-commutative version of the sum set estimates. And it works for matrices. And as far as I know, uh, this inequality is new. So this is not the usual way to consider some set estimate. Usually it's considered on finite type building groups, but actually here it also works for matrices in its group algebra. But still, uh, since we are talking about group symmetry, we regard this as a classical Fourier analysis. Now let's talk about something quantum. So when we talk about quantum fire analysis, we see we have many interesting inequalities from classical fire analysis. So what we are going to do here is to consider quantum symmetries. That's beyond group. And in classical analysis, actually, it's very important to study not just a single inequality, but a family of inequalities. And here for quantum symmetry, it's the uh, same thing. Uh, it's important to study not a single type of symmetry, but a family of symmetries. So we want to study different families of quantum symmetries. And here we can regard the group symmetry as one family of symmetry, and that's classical. And there are many different kinds of quantum symmetry coming from a like quantum field theory or conformal ones or topological ones. And before going into the general theory, which are hard to define in a quick way, but I will give you a example, go beyond group symmetry, but somehow related to group case. So given a finite group, G, and then we can consider the representations of G 
And among that, we can take the irreducible representations. And for example, if we take G to be the group, symmetric group S3, it has three irreducible representations. The trivial representation, and the sign representation, and the two-dimensional representation. So their dimensions will be one, one, and two. And moreover, for the group representations, we have the tensor product for the representations. And the tensor product of two representation is still a representation of the group. And moreover, we can when we take tensor, we can decompose that again as irreducible representation. Like if you take sign representation, its tensor is trivial. And if you take the sign representation multiply gamma, it's gamma. And if you take gamma square, the tensor of two rep two dimensional representation, we get the sign uh, the trivial representation the sign representation and gamma itself. So now if you look at this formula and you consider this in an abstract way, that has abstract symbols, and then you see there are three elements and you have a multiplication of this ring and the coefficients are integers. And this is actually similar to the group case. But the difference is we'll take multiplication of two elements, you may get a sum, a positive sum. And in general, this is called fusion ring, given by Lustig. So by definition for fusion ring, it has a base, xi, and x1 is the unit, And if you take multiplication of two of them, you will get a sum over the base. And the coefficient is a natural number. And moreover, for each element, it has a unique due given by an evolution map such that then i, j, k, when we take k to be the trivial representation, namely a representation has a unique due, and their tensor has a, only one copy of the trivial representation. So that means this coefficient n, i, j, one is one. If i is j star or zero elsewhere. So this is the definition of fusion mean. And you see this is can be First, this is considered as the ring of group representations. But abstractly, you can consider this as a generalization of the group. And then we can ask why the, the classical Fourier analysis also holds on the fusion ring. So why is it the Fourier analysis? And here we regard the fusion ring as a quantum symmetry it's beyond the group case. Somehow the first uh, uh, generalization of the group symmetry beyond groups. Well, Q. So it, now we can say why does the quantum fire analysis holds on the fusion ring? And this is a question asked by Pivo, I think of. And in recent paper joined with Jin Song Wu and Sebastian, we are trying to study this. The answer is somehow yes. Let's see what happened. Now, once again, given a fusion ring, Q 
you know, let's call it R instead of G for the group. Uh, we also have two different ways to study that. The A side, we can consider the algebra given by functions on the fusion ring. And then we have two different kind of multiplication. One is the multiplication, the usual one as multiplication of functions. And the other one is the convolution. So here, similar to the group case, for the group case, we have the group multiplication. It plays through of the convolution on functions. Here, we also have a, this fusion multiplication, this part. And we can use that to define the convolution. So now we have two different multiplications on this space, functions on R. And then we can study the higher measure. So it's a measure invariant and the convolution, but here, since it's no longer the group, group multiplication. So by higher measure we mean it's the positive character. And actually there is a unique positive character on the fusion ring. And this follows from the problem theorem. So usually we also call this the Kronfrobnitz dimension. And the dimension has the following property. It's, it's a character and positive. Positive. So this is the setup for the A side. We have multiplication, convolution, and the measure. And then you may ask why the, the inequalities we mentioned before still hold on this type of symmetry that's beyond groups. Now the answer is yes. So if we have young C inequality, and the convolution positivity. Oh. And the uh, sum set estimate. So we can study similar thing. And we say, yes, they all works, but it doesn't work in this setup, in this exact setup. We have to make a modification. So for this modification, we need to normalize that by another scalar, xi. So to distinguish with the usual modification of functions, well, xi, you consider that as the function that has one at xi and zero as well elsewhere. I simply find the notation as xi. So their multiplication, usually it should be xi times delta ij, the cos neck data. That's the usual multiplication of function. But here we need to modify this by the dimension, the this dimension of xi. It may not look apparent why we need such a modification, but there are other background coming from the like factor theory or the theory of categories and its string field center. That this is a natural way to define the multiplication for this fusion ring to encode interesting Fourier analysis. And after we modify this as a diamond multiplication, then all the inequalities hold. 
if we don't make such modification, then like young thing quality doesn't work very well. So, oh, so this gives a, a generalization of this classical inequalities from group symmetry to the fusion rings. Now we can also look at the B side. And then the algebra will become the algebra of the ring, once again, acting on L2R, this Hilbert space. So we also consider that as the left regular representation. And then we can consider the multiplication of this matrix algebra. And since we are considering representation of LR, so this multiplication now becomes the multiplication of the ring. And then we consider convolution. Now what's the convolution? So for the group case, on two different sides, the multiplication gave you the convolution and the convolution gave you a multiplication on two different sides because the Fourier transform intertwines the two. So here, uh, well, and also for the group case, the convolution is hot mod product, but here it's actually different. Let's compute this precisely for the example, this group representation of S3. So for rep S3, recall that we have three representations and with this fusion rule, Now, if we take the left the regular rep representation, the, the trivial representation is the identity matrix. And the sign representation is this matrix. And the gamma is this matrix. It's given by the previous fusion rule. Now, what is the diamond product? The diamond product says if you take Two different elements like this, that's zero. Well, but if you take the same element, it's a scalar multiple of this element, and the scalar is its dimension inverse. So here's one half. And for the diamond product, it's on the function side. So on the side of matrices, we consider this product, this diamond product, as convolution under the Fourier dual. So that means if we take the convolution of R and R, it's one half of R. Now you see, under the usual Hartman product, this R or gamma is a projection. But under this new product, Designed for the fusion ring, it's no longer projection. So in general, this convolution on matrices may not be the Hadamard product. Now we need to be careful. Then why do we still preserve the positivity? Whether for the convolution of two matrices is still positive. Now if you check this for on the B side, so this is A side. Now let's see what happened for the B side. So if you consider this example, like rep G for a group that has three, then all the three result holds. Like we still have Young thing inequality, convolution positivity, and some set estimates. 
for the fusion ring of ref G and for the dual side of the fusion ring of ref G. But if we just look at the general fusion ring, then they don't hold. So when we first see that, actually, we are very surprising. Just um, those classical inequalities, if we do that for the quantum symmetry for the fusion rings, sometimes they do, they do not hold. And we can find give very concrete counter examples. But for some special fusion rings, they come from groups like ref G, the inequality holds. So this gives a distinction between the general fusion ring and some special interesting fusion rings come from representation of the groups. And actually, not, we cannot only distinguish the fusion ring from the ones from groups. The general theorem is the following. So if the fusion ring is the Gaussian decree, of a unitary fusion category then the Yanzi inequality, the convolution positivity and some set estimate hold. on green and on both sides on both A model and B model. But in general it may not hold on the B model. It always hold on A side. So the theorem What's the meaning of a unitary fusion category? If we read this, uh, well, first, if it's ref G, then it's always unitary fusion category for a group G. And in general, people also study the representation of coffee algebra, weak coffee algebra. So it will be beyond the group case. But there are many examples. And it's a very important topic because uh, from the unitary fusion category, you can get two interesting things. One is the Torel Vera. three-dimensional topological quantum field theory. And also in the condensed matter literature, it's studied as Levin-Wynn model. So they're almost parallel theorems, but from quite different perspectives. So you can say, okay, if we start with an abstract fusion ring, whether we can categorify that and then we get this unitary fusion category. And once you have that, you you get other interesting applications in topology or in condensed matter. So this is a uh, this is a very important problem whether we can categorify a fusion ring. And here, from the Prowitz theorem, you see we have a distinction. In general, the fusion ring doesn't have such good analytic properties, but once it can be categorized, then it does have those interesting inequalities from quantum Fourier analysis. So quantum Fourier analysis provides analytic obstructions.
and those are completely new obstructions. And we test this obstruction for some concrete examples, and uh, once again, it's very surprising. These are very efficient obstructions. And our collaborator, Sebastian Pelcox, Uh, he actually has 17 integral fusion rings about seven years ago. And it's very important to categorify such kind of fusion ring because uh, if it can, can be categorified, there will be the uh, example that are integral but not coming from groups. So somehow very weird, something look at the integral but not from the group. The big word of groups. So we want to know whether they can be categorified. And he asked uh, actually many expert, many experts whether any of them can be categorified or be ruled out. But in general, it's very hard to show whether children can be categorified as equivalent to solve the Pentagon equation. And usually we don't expect to solve such complicated equation. And here we test the analytic obstruction, in particular, the sure product definition, since it's easy to verify. It's essentially check the characters of this, and of them actually commutative. It's essentially check the uh, characters of, of the fusion ring and to show the multiplication of two positive characters is also positive sum of positive of, of characters, similar to group case. But here, when we take the multiplication, we need to modify that again by the quantum dimension because we modify that in the definition of function, uh, multiplication of functions in A model. But uh, let's skip the detail. Uh, finally, we showed 15 out of the 17 cannot be unitarily categorified. There's really a large percentage of uh, those fusion units that can be ruled out using the analytic obstructions. So this is a very important application of the uh, quantum Fourier analysis to the problem in algebra that's the categorification of fusion units. Now, let's talk about part three. So there are, here we only mention one kind of symmetry that's beyond the group symmetry. It's given by the fusion ring. Somehow, generalization of the representation ring of groups. And there are two different directions to consider the generalization. One way is the quantum symmetry. And actually, here we mentioned several examples, but we didn't really study the examples in this way at the beginning. In the early work, we study this quantum fire analysis on subfactors. And it's a theorem developed, model theorem developed by Jones my PhD uh, advisor. So I started sub subfactor with him and tried to work on his analytic properties. And all the examples we mentioned before, as groups of fusion rings or their dues come as special case of subfactors. That's very interesting examples.
And there are other kind of interesting examples related to subfactor theory or the system of sectors of some quantum field theory. And also here at the beginning, we, we said we take finite group and here for fusion it's also finite. So another generalization for the quantum symmetry is from finite to infinite. And like we can consider finite group, but also infinite group. Or the finite fusion ring or infinite fusion ring. And for subfactor case, we can say finite index subfactors or infinite index subfactors. Or for the quantum group, we can take finite dimensional ones or infinite dimensional ones. Here we require positivity. So they are C star quantum groups, also called Cassie algebras. So for the infinite dimensional case, we can study the infinite dimensional Cassie algebras. Or a more general situation called locally compact quantum groups. And we also have similar phenomena. We can two different generalizations, one for the finite case, but quite wild symmetries. And somehow this subfactor here is uh, on this level, it's more or less the same as the unit with two categories. And for the, we can also do that for the infinite dimensional case. And then it will involve much more tricky uh, analytic properties. And another direction is to co consider uh, different type of inequalities. In particular, inequality in families. And one famous inequality in Fourier analysis is the breast camp leap inequality. It's a very well inequality. It's generalized many classic ones like Young's inequality, Hurd inequality, Loomis Whitney inequality as a special case. And this has been studied in 1978 in Redis, and it has been popular in the past 40 years, and still it's a very active topic. And in our paper, QFA paper, this peanut paper in 2020, we gave a universal inequality as an analog. Of this breast cap leap inequality but with additional topological property or uh, some pictorial version of this universal inequality. And again, in our case, this inequality will include like Young's inequality and other special like Hawker inequality special case. And moreover, our pictorial formalization will also include the Hostoff Young inequality as special case, and which is not the case for the classical breast camp leap. So it may be possible to have a more general inequality for breast camp leap, but with additional example, the host of an inequality involved. And those inequalities now in our setup also works for other type of quantum symmetries like fusion rings or subfactors or Cassie algebras. So that's kind of another direction we expect to study in the future. We study families of inequalities for quantum symmetries. Now, at the end, since in this talk, I didn't give any proof, and this is picture language seminar, and I like picture very much. So I will give a pictorial proof of one of the properties we mentioned above. And in a pictorial way, actually, based on topological field theory, all planar algebras introduced by Jones. Uh, we can consider the functions on G, the A model or the B model as a square like pictures. 
and the region has alternating shading. And then the multiplication of two elements will be stacking the diagram vertically and the convolution is stacking the diagram horizontally and the measure like the trace of x is capping the diagram I have similar picture on the B side, but with alternating shading. And then you can see what is the Fourier transform in this case. The Fourier transform becomes the 90 degree rotation. And this is properly observed early by Adrian Okiani. in the setup of TKFT, and here we do it in the setup of planar algebras, and which is more compatible with the analytic property. And now let's check one property, which is this convolution positivity or the short product property. So it said if X and Y are positive operators, and then we want to show their convolution is positive. And now as the operator is a positive operator, so we can decompose it, it has a square of its square root. Using the multiplication. And now we can decompose the picture in the middle. Then you see the top side it's still a mirror image of the other one. So one is the joint of the other. And then the multiplication of the operator and its joint is positive. So that's the proof. And actually, even though we are working on a very general quantum symmetry, based on additional idea coming from topological field theory or other pictorial methods, the proof may not be that complicated. Sometimes it becomes even simpler. So with new ideas, we can actually give quite simple proof for more general setup. And here I want to highlight one point. This element is in this function space on the, like on the fusion ring or groups. But this element is not the usual element in this algebra. Like for the fusion category case, we prove that this is an element in the dream field center. So essentially, when we prove those uh, inequalities for quantum Fourier analysis on fusion categories, we actually go to the few, uh, the dream field center of the fusion category, and then prove some inequalities there. And we show those inequalities do not hold if they are just fusion rings. So in this way, we can get analytic obstructions as mentioned ahead. Well, this is the pictorial proof. And it's very short, um, but you already see it's actually very powerful. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cheng Wei, for a really beautiful talk. You brought so many ideas together in such a simple way. It's just amazing. I, I'm sure there are many questions. In fact, maybe I could start with a question because in your abstract, you mentioned entropy. And could you just. Oh mention how you connect with entropy. Yes, I'm sorry. I shall mention that earlier. Another very important part is uh, here we mentioned three inequalities. Um, Young's inequality, the convolution positivity of short product, and the sum set estimate. But actually there are tremendous inequalities in classical Fourier analysis. And one important thing to measure the element is not just the p norm, but also the entropy. And the classical one is called the Shannon entropy for the commutative case called the phonema entropy. 
for the non-commutative case. Uh, it can be an operator. Uh, and also, uh, there are entropies more general than this one, like the Rennie entropy or the relative entropy. And in particular, all those entropies are very important measure in quantum information theory. They have been widely used in quantum information. And it's a very important thing to measure. And uh, so here we highlight the Fourier duality. And we know for the entropy, a very important e inequality is the Heisenberg uncertainty, uh, well, somehow Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And it's generalized for entropy by uh, Hirschman and uh, the best constant is given by Beckner and also follow from the work of Leap as well. Uh, so we can actually have uncertainty principle for such entropies. For for your duality over quantum symmetry. And those are all. Oh, and one thing is very important, that's called the entanglement entropy. I forgot to mention, entangle. In quantum information. And actually in the general setup, we can prove, approve several uh, uncertainty principles for such entropies. Like in the QFA paper, we prove this uh, uncertainty principle for relative entropy. And if we apply, the quantum symmetry, the general case, to some special case, then we can get interesting results on special case. And here I give you one hint, how do we apply those inequalities? Like how do we understand the entanglement entropy? Uh, very basic example. If we take the operator on the group, like functions on Z2, and then there is a Fourier duality between the identity matrix. and the run one projection. So they are far due to each other. And then we can compute the uh, full name entropy for both operators. And it's far transform. We'll have a lower bound bigger than zero. Now, if we read this in a different way, if we don't read this as an operator, but as a tensor product, a vector in tensor product, and usually it's written in this way, zero, zero plus one, one, then it's a due will become zero, zero. And then this phoneme entropy becomes entanglement entropy. And then we see on one side is bell state, we know it's, it has maximum entropy. On the other side is a product state, we know it has minimum entropy. And here our interpretation is for the entanglement entropy, we also have this kind of uncertainty principle. And the sum of the two and the Fourier duality has a lower bound. And if one of them gets minimum, then the other actually gets maximum. And in this way, the, if we consider zero as the ground state, ground state that it's Fourier due, we will have this maximum entropy. And this is a toy model, but it actually works in a very general setup, like for Katayev's Hori code. It has a very interesting ground state. And then we can build up a very interesting Fourier transform, such that the ground state for Katayev's model is the Fourier due of zero state. And that Fourier transform 
actually has a very interesting topological meaning. And it's given by the topological Fourier transform in TQFT, topological quantum theory, field theory, but on higher genus. A higher genus surface. So this has a very deep connection between the topological field theory on higher genus and the other side is the condensed matter side. So they actually very general fire transform, much more beyond the example I mentioned here. And they all have highly natural analytic properties. And here for our case, we can also measure the uh, like the operator using entropies, and we get the interest and certainty principles. And by using different examples, different Fourier transform, different entropy, we get different inequalities. And with different simulation in quantum information, we can actually get different interpretations. Thank you. I have some other questions, but I think first Werner Nam has a question. Uh, yes. In your general categories, general fusion categories, Yes. Are all objects uh, decomposable into irreducibles, or do you need some tanaka grind generalization? Oh, here, here uh, when we talk about this problem for categorification, uh, first we are mainly interested in the uh, fusion category with finitely many simple objects. And then that corresponds to the representation of a finite group. And then everything can be decomposed into irreducible ones. And this can be easily generalized to the compact case. We have infinite many simple objects, but not for the locally compact ones. And actually there's a different story. Like when we deal with locally compact quantum groups, the deal will be also like locally compact, like the real lines. And the topology will be quite different. It's no longer discrete. And that has quite different kind of problem for the analysis. But the example I mentioned here are mainly finite case and then everything will decompose into irreducible ones. And also when we say fusion category, that already means the algebra is semi-simple. So there's no neopotent part. Thank you. So are there other questions? Yeah, this is Rad. I have a question. Now the notion of Schwartz spa spaces and tempered distributions, do they have mm -hmm. an analog of that in this context? Oh uh, yes, yes, very good question. So first, uh, uh, for the final case, it's easy to explain. Uh, when we say we have two different models, A side and B side, mm -hmm. actually we can not only intertwine multiplication and convolution, but also the measure. On this side, we have higher measure. On the other side, we have the trace. Mm -hmm. And if we take it to trace back, it's actually a direct measure at the unit element. Yeah, yeah. And for the final case, there's no problem. And for the infinite case, this will be really the direct measure. It has value infinity at a single point. Okay. But for the, because topology is not this quick, so it's somehow well defined in the due. And then when we deal with the uh, infinite dimensional examples, indeed, we need to deal with such measure. And it works very well. And uh, for locally compact quantum groups, the setup is given by many other people. And one book we have used is given by Stephen Wass and uh, his collaborator, uh, yeah. Kuma Wass. And uh, they have a good setup saying, okay, both measures are well defined. And another problem is here we use the pictorial method in topological field theory. And then now most uh, uh, popular ones are all about finite symmetries. And actually we also have ongoing work to have those kind of infinite symmetries, but with topological field theory behind. And that part, this direct measure is very tricky. It's extremely interesting. I can give a hint, namely, uh, we have to be very careful for the infinite dimensional case because the test functions are good, like Schwarz function. And if we want to define those direct measure, it has to be defined as a due. Mm -hmm. And here the hint is for those abstract notion like those label, they are considered as test functions. They are very good. Okay. And the tangle, are considered as something in the due, and they could be unbounded operators, and that could include the Dirac measure. 
Thank you. Thank you, Red. So I'd like to come back to the thing you mentioned about extremizers, but you didn't elaborate on it. You know very well in the Gaussian case that Vector showed that Gaussian extremizes Hausdorff Young and other inequalities, and many studies have been done about that. What is known in quantum Fourier analysis about extremizers? Yes, thank you. Uh, for quantum Fourier analysis, uh, we can consider extremizers for different cases. But for the finite case, most of them are related to concepts called by shift of by projections. And by projection in subfact setup is studied by Dietmar Bisch. And here we have a generalization of that. And this is considered as an analog of Gaussian functions. And uh, they share many interesting analytic properties, even though they look different at the beginning. And then we can trust uh, somehow transform the statement from one side to another side. And at the beginning, we try to understand a lot of properties for Gaussians. And then we show they also works for the special for by projection for quantum symmetries. But later, actually, we found something more interesting. We have some statement for special for by projections. And then we propose conjectures for Gaussian functions. And this is what we call the 2D central limit theorem. And by pictures, it's actually easy to explain. As I mentioned, we consider the elements in the A or B algebra as a square. And one direction is multiplication, one direction is convolution. Then you can think about that. If we take this element, and then we take a square, and take a square in the other direction, let's say x is positive and its Fourier transform is also positive for simplicity. And then this is kind of a renormalization map. We can average the elements in two different directions. And up to a proper scalar normalization. And then we have shown that under this renormalization, we call it block map. Uh, this limit is by projections. And each back projection is actually an invariant, invariant point under this dynamic. So this has a very good dynamic, it converges to back projections. Now, we also test this for Gaussian, fun uh, for real function, like if you take C infinity functions on reals. And then if you run this map, up to the scalar, if this is R k, this will be normalized by scalar. And this limit will be Gaussian. So somehow you can consider uh, we have the convolution, we repeat the convolution, and then we rescale the size of R, that's the usual central limit theorem. And then essentially we use the multiplication in one direction. And here we use the multiplication in both directions. And we repeat that. It's kind of mix the central limit theorem for both directions. And then we test that. This is still convergence to Gaussian function, but we only test this numerically. And it's extremely fast. It converges to Gaussian functions rapidly, but this is still conjecture. We don't have a theoretical proof. So I would be very excited if uh, there is a theoretical proof of this statement. It seems very reasonable. We take a function, we take this kind of 2D renormalization, and then it converges to Gaussian. But so far, uh, we don't have a proof yet. Is this related to a central limit theorem in free probabilities? Uh, not yet. And, uh, but uh, the conceptual reason is we believe the entropy not the single entropy, but the entropy from uncertainty principle. You take a sum of entropy for function and it's due. 
and we believe this map will decrease the entropy. And since the Gaussian function are minimizers of that, and that should be the conceptual reason why this converges to Gaussian function. But uh, we also cannot prove that. Um, yeah, so when you talk about the central limit theorem, you have to talk about the stochastic independence. So yes. kind of, uh, you're assuming a commutative independence? Yes, yes. Here, when we say uh, all the elements are all x, that means we take independent random variables, but here they are non commutative ones. And yes. of course, you can replace x by other elements and then ask this limit again. And then we have no good estimates so far. Yeah, so that, yeah, that will change the stochastic independence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So are there are other questions. Yeah, uh, I, could I ask a question? Uh, so oh. in, uh, hi. Uh, so in uh, classical Fourier analysis, one of the major tools that people use is stationary phase to do asymptotics and this kind of thing. Is there any kind of notion of that yet or is that too early to be thinking about? Uh, not yet, it's too early. I'm sorry too about early. that. And also yeah. uh, there's one problem is when we first consider this, we are considering subfactors. And for subfactors, the finite index sub subfactors yeah. is a very fruitful theory. And that means the algebra we are looking at is finite dimensional, but it's a family of finite dimensional algebra. And for the finite case, uh, we lose we lose many interesting properties, and but uh, mm -hmm. on the other side, mm -hmm. since we are considering Wait, very no, no, no notion of asymptotic. Sorry. No notion of asymptotics then. Uh, 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 right. Maybe that, yes, the, that's the, yes, know. that's the problem. Since when we go from infinite to finite, some notion just disappeared, and we cannot study that at, at this okay. point. So, so there's no notion of being approximately semi-classical or something like that? Uh, uh, we, we are trying to understand that. And actually, uh, we have this concept called surface algebra. And then we can have a notion like a symptotic phenomenon. But then look at that in a different uh -huh. way. Okay. The point is following. Here, when we say a single square, like the algebra, then we take analogs, we consider that as a a generalization of a single qubit. That's for two dimensional case, but this is more general. And then even though this is one dimensional, but like single qubit is two dimensional, but the tensor product could be infinite dimensional. And that fits very well in subfactor theory, as I said. A subfactor actually considers not just a, a single space, but it's a inductive limit. And this inductive limit gives you the factor as a infinite dimensional phonema algebra. So here we can do similar thing. We can take the square as a single qubit or general, a single algebra, and then we can take tensor product by taking multiple squares. And then using a new machine, we call surface algebras. And for quantum information case, it's the QR language. Oops. And then we can start the infinite phenomenon. And we believe this is rest set up. But since we just start, we, we, we haven't have some promising result at this point. Thank you. So Chengba, you mentioned earlier in your talk an, a new classical inequality that comes out of uh, thinking about things from the point of view of quantum Fourier analysis. Are there quantum inequalities you don't see in classical Fourier analysis in different sort. Uh, yes, one example is this uh, the two D central limit theorem. Uh, as far as we know, this is not considered in classical Fourier analysis. But we believe this holds for the classical case, like functions on rules. And actually, if the group is a finite group, then it's a it's it fits well in our framework. And we already proved that. Indeed, uh, for the group case, if you run this 2D dynamics system, and then the limit will be indicator function on subgroups. And for subfactors, it will be intermediate subfactors. For fusion categories, it will be full subcategories. So all correspond to intermediate concepts. And then for the real line, since it's locally compact, there's no open compact subgroups. 
and then we have a different phenomena. We believe it converges to Gaussians. So that's kind of well, one example we can uh, we can get new ideas, and this idea really comes from somehow condensed matter, this two D renormalization, and then we give give it back to uh, classical Fourier analysis, and we have this uh, two D central limit soft price conjecture. Are there other questions? Um, if I'm allowed to ask, um, so in your paper, <clears throat> you are relating a quantum Fourier transform to the entanglement, and that's a different point of view compared to the braiding. Uh, is yes. Is possible to expand? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, one way in our early paper in the 2 three model, the paper holographic software, the Fourier transform, like for the elements with four points, is this kind of rotation. So it has no grid, it's defined on a plane. And then you see the fourth power will be identity. And actually, another thing in generalization which is very important is, we can also take a diagram with six boundary points. Diagrammatically, we don't see difference. And then take this rotation. Then it will have pure audacity pure six. And this can be also regarded as a Fourier transform. And in this interpretation, there is no grid. Everything is defined on plane, and that's why actually one called planar algebra. But actually, for some special case, like if we not we are not talking about fusion category, but modular tensor category, coming from conformal field theory, then it has the very rich structure that's the grid. And then in that case, there is a well-known transformation called the S matrix. Uh, first started by Tuft. And this is also considered as a fire transform, and it's actually a very important transformation for conformal field theory. And now for this transformation, I would consider this is at uh, the fire transform for genus one powers. Well, not I, but people always consider it in that way. Like we have a torus, the genus one, and then we have this circle in this torus labeled by I, the possible configuration. And then the J will be the configuration in the dual space, the complement of torus in three sphere. That's also torus. And then this is a topological duality. That's the Fourier transform. And actually, it's not apparent, but that's indeed the case. This Fourier transform can be identified as this 90 degree rotation with different pictorial interpretation. There is a full functorial identification between the two sides using Orbifold theory. And not only for this one, but also for the higher genus case. Say, if you have a genus two, torus, and then the configuration will be like this. And then in the dual, the configuration will be like this. And in this way, you can define another S matrix at this value. So that's a Fourier duality for the genus two powers. And then by a careful choice of basis, you can show its periodicity is six. And then again, by all the power theory, it corresponds to this diagram on the plane. So on one side, this uh, diagram in modular tensor category has grids. So you can define a Fourier duality using braids. But on the other side, that's the powerful part of, of our power theory. You can study the TKFT on higher genus Riemann surface by looking at another TKFT on the Riemann surface without genus. And this is kind of the uh, correspondence. And th in this way, we can translate the diagram with braids to diagrams on the plane without braids. Thank you. Well, I think we've covered quite a large number of topics. So unless there's any other pressing question, I think we should thank Cheng Wei again. Are there any other questions? It's such an inspiring thing to have a new subject where so many familiar concepts seem to be connected to it. Thank you very much, Cheng Wei. That's all. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, everyone.
See you next week. Bye-bye.